Hi, and welcome to the Show Me Progress YouTube 2.0 channel. I'm Tammy Booth, but you may know me better as Blue Girl from such blogs as Blue Girl Red State, They Gave Us a Republic, Crooks and Liars, the Facebook feed to Washington Monthly, and of course, Show Me Progress. We're here at Axwa in the, in the lovely Crestwood neighborhood in Kansas City, and we're chatting with State Senator Jolie Justice about the session that just ended. Senator, thank you for making the time to talk with us this morning. Thanks for having me. It was an interesting session for sure. I've heard of going from the sublime to the ridiculous, but this session seemed to start there. And by the time the Wingnut Express rolled to a stop, we were deep into territory that we haven't considered since 1865. You know, it was an interesting session for sure. There's no question that um, the politics on a national level um, we saw on a local level as well. And I think we had a lot of interesting ideas come out of the House and I was just glad that we have the deliberative body of the Senate where we were able to slow some of those things down. So are we. <laughs> I think we're fortunate that some of the stuff was so far out in right field because the, a lot of the really crazy stuff didn't make it through. Um, some of the stuff that did pass wasn't too awful. Cell phones can now be added to the no-call list. That's a good thing. Mandatory sentencing rules for crack cocaine versus powder were modified. Probation reform. But there really was some awful stuff that did pass. What do you think was the worst thing they managed to get through? Not the silliest. The worst. The, the worst thing that got through this year was um, a change to the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan. There's no question that um, there's absolutely no need for us to actually reform that um, in any way. The Missouri Court Plan works, and uh, we do not want to get into a situation where we put all of the power into one governor's office when it comes to selecting judges. It's not safe. When we like the governor, it's fine. When we don't like the governor, it's not fine. So um, I think it's a dangerous move. Fortunately, the people of Missouri will have a chance to vote on it this fall and my hope is they'll vote it down. What failed bill concerned you the most and gave you the greatest sense of relief when it died? Well I think that the compromise that we negotiated on women's reproductive health issues was probably the the greatest thing that we did because while we did pass a ridiculous bill in the form of Senate Bill 749 um, we were able to stop um, some crazy bills relating to conscience clauses that would allow hospitals and health care workers to deny health care services to Missourians based on their moral beliefs or religious beliefs and because we were able to stop or because we were willing to let um, a restatement of existing law go through we were able to stop the more regressive bills so that was probably my biggest sigh of relief. That brings me to my next question. Women really took a hit this session. Let's talk about some of the awful things that, that were done to to the women of Missouri. Yeah, it, it was the, the war on women nationally was also taking place in Missouri this year. There were several bills that were very regressive, some of which would say that employers don't have to provide birth control to their employees. Um, at one point, one of the pieces of legislation that was going through basically said that if you needed any sort of medical procedure that might result in sterilization, that your insurance company did not have to pay for it or your employer did not have to pay for it. Um, fortunately, we were able to scale some of that back and get that back into a version of just a restatement of existing law. And then um, we were able then to actually, through that compromise, stop some more regressive bills. So that was a good thing. But yeah, the, the same thing that was going on in D.C. was definitely happening in Missouri. If you could wave a magic wand and pass one of the good pieces of legislation that failed, what would it be? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I started this year working on two issues relating to criminal justice reform that I'm really excited about, and one actually made it across the finish line, which was the uh, Justice Reinvestment Act, which is going to take a look at criminal sentencing and make sure that we get the right mix of folks in prison, that we stop spending money on locking folks away instead of getting at the root issues that have people reoffending in the first place. But part of that is a complete rewrite of the criminal code, which hasn't been done since the 1970s. Ike Skelton was actually the last person to push this through the Missouri legislature. And I filed it this year. Um, embarrassingly, it was actually the largest bill filed in the history of the Missouri legislature. It was over a thousand pages long. We obviously 
since it was so huge, we're not able to get it done this year. I'm looking forward to getting that done in the next two years because I think it'll be really go a long way to clean up our criminal code and make sure that we're not putting folks in jail unnecessarily when the result is that they come out and reoffend. when we could be giving them the services they need on the front end so that they don't do that. Good. I, I, I approve of that, especially as a, as a, I'm, I'm going to be a lawyer, so I care about these things deeply. Um, I have to ask you about the sullying of the Hall of Famous Missourians with an infamous one that was added for the express purpose of serving as a monument to spite. You know, it was incredibly frustrating this year to have the issue of the Rush Limbaugh Famous Missourian pop up. Um, you know, the reality is that it is completely up to the speaker. It's totally in his or her discretion who goes into that Hall of Famous Missourians. And, and no public dollars were spent to, to make that statue and put it in there. The problem is, though, is just the, the outcry that came from the public, and it was totally justified. I mean, this is not the kind of person that we should be putting into our Hall of Famous Missourians. And I think that one simple approach that we could take as a state is to say, we're not going to put anyone in that Hall of Famous Missourians until after they're dead. And that way we can look at the totality of their career and make a decision at that point. Um, that would have been an easy fix, but unfortunately the speaker wasn't willing to do that. The one thing that's made me angry in the last couple of days is I did find out that state taxpayer dollars are going to be used to put a camera on the statue in case of vandalism. And that really frustrates me because you may remember at the beginning of the session, several senators, including myself, were targeted um, twice, actually, with death threats. And uh, one of the issues that we brought up is whether or not uh, we should have cameras for our own security and the security of the general public. And we were basically told, no, that's something we can't do. So I'm really frustrated that at this point, the Missouri House of Representatives has decided that they are going to use state payer dollars to protect a statute you of someone that most Missourians are not fans of, but they won't use it to protect school kids who are coming in to visit the Capitol or the legislators and employees who report to work every day. Redistricting this year was an interesting process and one of the things that happened is is they actually moved my district number, which is number 10, from Kansas City all the way over to the eastern side of the state. So I represent now the counties of Callaway, Audrain, Monroe, Montgomery, Warren, and Lincoln. And um, at first I was a little bit taken aback because I thought, well, what am I going to have in common with these folks? But then I decided it was actually a pretty cool opportunity. First of all, just as the, I, I'm running for minority leader next year, and so there's a good chance that I'll be the, the head of the Senate Democrats. And first things first, we're going to pick up one extra Democrat no matter what, because my replacement will be um, decided in an election on August 7th. So we're going to go from eight to nine automatically. Also, through the redistricting process, several of the um, districts became more democratic. So there is a possibility that we could go up to 10, 11, or even 12 Democrats in the Senate, which would be fantastic because then the Senate would no longer have a veto-proof majority. And it makes our ability to negotiate with the majority party a lot easier when there's 12 of us than when there's eight of us. Um, on the flip side, I like the idea that this is going to be a teaching moment. I'm going to be able to go over to the eastern side of the state and I'm going to be able to show the folks over there, number one, that uh, just because I am an openly gay woman who's progressive from Kansas City, that doesn't mean that I don't care about the same values that they care about in eastern Missouri. Um, I tell folks that I was raised in the Ozark Mountains by Republicans. I can get along with anybody. So, um, And then the other thing that's exciting is there's so many Democrats who are crawling out of the woodwork in that area who are just so thankful that for the first time in years they're actually going to have Democratic representation. They've been represented by Republicans and sometimes extreme Republicans for several years now. So they're super excited and all of the Democratic clubs on that side of the state want me to come over and talk to them and, and they're just, even if it's only for two years, they're excited that they're finally going to have a Democrat. Well that's good news. It also raises your profile should you decide to run for something statewide later. Well who knows. Uh, right now I just am going to uh, do the best that I can as the in leadership of the Missouri Senate. Stop bad things from happening and move progressive ideas forward and that's that's my goal for the next two years. Let's wind up by talking about term limits. Sure. Let's wind up by talking about term limits and how they have contributed to the animal house atmosphere in the state Senate especially in the General Assembly. 
Yeah, there's two things that have really, I think, destroyed the legislature as it was once known. And the first is term limits. It's absolutely um, frustrating to see that just when you get some folks who are really good at what they're doing, um, they have to go out the door. Now, I understand every now and again through term limits, you're going to get rid of some folks that you don't like. And that's great. But the reality is, is you're also throwing out a lot of good folks as well. And then the institutional knowledge in the building is held by staffers and it's held by eventually just lobbyists. And that's not a place we want to be. More detrimental than term limits, though, is the fact that we have no caps on com campaign contributions in this state. Um, right now, it is not uncommon for a legislator to receive a contribution of $100,000, $250,000 from one individual. And there is absolutely nothing that can can prove to me that that doesn't cloud a person's judgment. And so I think that one of the things we have to address even before term limits in this state and nationwide is reasonable caps on campaign finance. Senator, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us this morning. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, and I hope we get a chance to do this again soon. That sounds great. Thank you, Tammy. It was good, great. Good luck, and thanks, and enjoy your summer. Thank you.